Welcome to Ayurveda and Spirituality with your host, Alakananda Ma, a renowned Ayurvedic expert and a graduate of a top London medical school. She is the principal of Alundi Ayurveda Gurukula, a unique apprenticeship style school in Boulder, Colorado. She is a spiritual mother, teacher, flower essence maker, and storyteller. Join us as we uncover the timeless principles of Ayurveda, discover practical tips for enhancing vitality, and explore the deeper dimensions of spirituality that intertwine with the ancient science of life. Welcome to Satsang. Satsang is a meeting of hearts, a gathering of friends to inquire into the truth. Today, we are going to address the topic yoga and ayurveda it, it's become quite common nowadays to talk about yoga and ayurveda as sister sciences um but that's not really accurate or that's more something that we've created nowadays it's certainly true that both yoga and ayurveda arise out of the Indian subcontinent, arise out of a certain context of culture and a certain philosophy of life. Ayurveda is the science of living an enhanced life. Ayush, it's, Ayush was never meant to be, live to be 90 something in a nursing home. Uh, I, as one uh, speaker at a conference I was at said, uh, Ayurveda is about not so much adding years to our life as adding life to our years. And he actually mentioned Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. and said, and very, very sadly, he could not add years to his life, but he added life to his years. So... In Ayurveda, we are here to increase the quality of our life. We are here to experience vasti. Vasti is well-being. Sva is self. Sta is stand. We get that in Latin too. Sto standing in ourselves in, in a state of, that's, that is, well-being so there's arogya disease-free condition not being sick but there's also svasti that state of well-being so <laughs> then what is yoga well the question what is yoga obviously is something widely misunderstood and in a way, yoga has become something else other than what it originally was, and that's not all bad. I think a, a lot of uh, positive things have been added to yoga in recent times. So at, at the same time, yoga is actually not a form of athletics or gymnastics. Yoga is not a sport. I remember a... A friend of mine, somewhat of a, of a woman of size, said she couldn't go to yoga class because she didn't have a yoga body. In other words, she wouldn't look right in in those like tightly fitting and quite sexy and very expensive yoga outfits that people wear at yoga studios. So she felt embarrassed to go to yoga class. Uh, which I can understand. Um, it can be embarrassing. Years gone by, women didn't even practice yoga. So that's, that's one positive development. In fact, the world of yoga has been very much taken over by women who have embraced so many of the spiritual practices that are available to people nowadays. So it, it's it's very, very much misunderstood what yoga is. Yoga is not about your clothes or getting in shape or it's not even really supposed to be about getting a great workout. Yoga is a profound 
philosophy of life. And we're going to look today into some very distinctive features whereby the philosophy of life that yoga carries and that that Ayurveda carries are significantly different. But there is a philosophy that both of them share, and that is the Samkhya philosophy. So we'll take a few moments to think about the Samkhya, Samkhya philosophy. It's a very interesting philosophy because it has sometimes been referred to as dualistic because it starts with a twofold principle. It's not dualistic. I, I don't think it's dualistic. I think that the idea that Samkhya is dualistic come, comes from Buddhism. But Buddhist polemic, dualistic means it, it's about two-ness and not oneness. Um, duality. Um, in Buddhist polemics, you set up all the other systems of philosophy to shoot them down. But what you're setting up is a straw man, a caricature, and not what that other philosophical system truly is, if you understand it. So yes, there, there is a, uh, a two-ness that we see because there is Purusha, and Purusha, Purusha is the lord of the city of nine gates. Puri is the city. I, I had a revelation about this word Puri when I was in a plane on Finnair, flying from Stockholm to well, London, I think. And uh, we were flying over Hamburg, and I was watching like the flight map, really enjoying it, and it said Hampuri in Finnish. Hamburg is Hampuri. And then I realized, oh, Berg and Burra and all of these things are just the word Puri, the city. Uh, so Pur Purusha is the lord of the city of nine gates. Purusha is embodied spirit. Purusha is the one incarnator. We often speak about reincarnation. And when we introduce the Western esoteric tradition into thinking about reincarnation, we can have really fancy ideas about who we were in a past lives. Nobody was ever anybody ordinary in a past life, although the most most people were ordinary. <laughs> you know, you you never were like, oh, I think in another in another life I was a farmer. You know, and I, I got up in the morning and I fed the chickens and I went to work and I came home and I spanked the kids, you know, drank the milk. No one ever has a past life like that. People were only somebody like super important in a past life. But that's that's one way of looking at reincarnation as I was this person or that person. But in a very pure philosophy, as we see it in Bhagavad Gita, Purusha is the one incarnator in all bodies. I, I remember hearing this from Father B. Griffith at Shantivanam in South India. As we take off our dirty clothes at the end of the day and put on clean ones the next day, as we discard a worn-out jacket for a new one, so Purusha leaves behind worn-out bodies and enters new ones. Purusha is changeless, primordial bliss consciousness. Nothing ever happens to Purusha. Prakriti, we have our word creation, we have the word karma, that kr is the root of the word prakriti. She's the bringer forth of everything. It is Prakriti who prepares for Purusha the vast banquet of phenomena which she spreads before him. There, there's a story that pertains to a temple we visited in Chennai 
it used to be called Madras when we were there, but now it's Chennai. And the story that goes with that temple is that Lord Shiva was fine, was getting bored. He was very bored, so he decided he'd just enter into meditation for a few thousand years. And when Lord Shiva entered into meditation, Shakti, who's the same as Prakriti, Shiva is the same as Purusha, and Shakti is the same as Prakriti. And she starts to get bored because she's not got anyone to play with. So she decides she'd better entertain him to like coax him out of this plan of having a pretty long meditation. So she takes on the form of a beautiful peacock and she spreads the magnificent tail and she dances to delight her consort. And that peacock tail that she spreads Parvati Shakti that peacock tail is everything is all phenomena you are a teeny tiny sparkle in that tail <laughs> you're, you're a little teeny sparkle in the vast story of phenomena but the reason why Samkhya is not really dualistic is that Shiva and Shakti, Purusha and Prakriti are inseparable. As Sri Ramakrishna says, like milk and its whiteness, like gold and its brightness, like fire and its power to burn. They are completely inseparable. So we, we have this the Purusha Prakriti, the change of primordial bliss, bliss consciousness, and the bringer forth of everything that is, everything that has been, everything that will be, that's manifest prakriti and unmanifest prakriti, everything that could be but actually never will be. And then we have the step down phenomenon. The ne so the next step down is on a cosmic level, mahad, cosmic consciousness, on the individual level, buddhi step down again so we're, when we're the baby in the womb we're floating around in buddhi or in mahad baby in the womb doesn't know today's friday we're in boulder it's cloudy today i'm called sam what well, a baby in the womb doesn't know any of those things baby in the womb is just floating around in changeless primordial bliss consciousness then birth happens i need to take a breath and ahamka the uh, ego, the I thought arises. Ahamkar literally means the I thought. And with that I thought comes manas, comes the mind that can measure. With the I thought come the three gunas, sattva, the mode of purity, rajas, the mode of passion, tamas, the mode of ignorance. And arising from here, Come the five elements, space, air, fire, water, earth. Come the five Nyanindriyani, our five senses. Come the five Parmindriyani, our five action organs. Come the five Tanmatras, the uh, objects of the five senses. And everything is laid out. So that Samkhya philosophy is very fundamental to both Ayurveda and yoga, even though yoga in and of itself is considered one of Shaddarshan, one of the six systems of philosophy, its own philosophical system, yet it does draw very much on having Samkhya as a basis. Ayurveda also does use all of the six systems of philosophy, but does root itself very much in Samkhya. So that's uh, that's something that they really do have in common. However, yoga and Ayurveda embody very different approaches. They are very different as paths. So we're going to look into that a little more.
basically yoga as we know has eight limbs uh, yoga begins with yama yoga begins with our ability to follow moral discipline very, very similar kinds of moral discipline to those found in buddhism also and a lot along with yama then comes niyama we not only have the, have the don'ts thou shalt not kill thou shalt not steal thou shalt not commit adultery etc we also have our positive duties our positive observances and that's the niyamas from there we come to the popular part of yoga which is asana uh, all the different postures that are used in yoga which we actually weren't supposed to start on until first starting on yama and niyama but things are a little bit different nowadays we also have to practice all of those asanas within yama and niyama so if if you if you're the sort of person that ruptures your knee by how you do pachimottanasan you didn't practice with ahimsa <laughs> right we we have we in every asana that we want to practice we actually have to introduce all of the yamas and niyamas in order to practice the asanas properly and there's really two different and very important streams of yoga that i've had the chance to study during my life the the eightfold yoga ashtanga yoga that comes from patanjali's yoga sutras and here the whole point of doing asana is for sthira sukhavasana to be able to sit comfortably and meditate i became aware of the importance of that when i first arrived in india at shantivanam and everyone's sitting on the floor we're, we're, we're in we're in the little temple and father bead is conducting the mass in sanskrit and then we're meditating and we're listening to his talks and all of us newcomers are squirming around because we we haven't gained the ability to have stira sukhasan if you're supposed to be able to sit without moving for three hours which the great swami shivananda says is essential for the for the practice of yoga then you have to be able to practice other poses strengthen all of your muscles to gain that ability something i realized after only after i introduced belly dance into my practice did i realize that being being able to sit on the floor straight is not only about your back muscles <laughs> you have to actually lift your chest which for those of us well endowed in the bust area takes some work takes some effort because we were getting pulled down uh i learned that from belly dance because we kind of like wiggle and jiggle and generally make a lot of uh interesting use of those muscles because remember yoga was designed for men belly dance was designed for women so we have to sort of like mingle the two a little bit on the other hand there's not only Patanjali, there's also Hatha Yoga Pradipika and Garhanda Samhita, which really, really delves into each and every asana and their benefits. So for once we start introducing yoga as chikitsa, yoga as therapeutics, which it never was used for in ancient times, it comes in very handy to have those texts that tell us the benefits stupendous benefits i mean if you if you if you do your sarvangas and your shoulder stand properly for a long time you'll like live for like a thousand years or something of course it's hard to do it properly enough 
so we've now from the asanas we go on to the pranayama breathing techniques methods of increasing prana these have also become greatly popularized nowadays have to this has to be properly taught by a proper teacher because you can do a lot of damage to yourself practicing pranayama in fact Sadanand and I studied uh, beginning, intermediate, and advanced pranayama, and came back to Nadi Shodan. Is it? Is this having studied advanced pranayama, you can really see the benefit and the beauty of ground level, which is Nadi Shodan. But then something really interesting happens in the path of yoga. Once we've learned to live in a decent way through yama and niyama, once we've developed the ability to sit in a good posture, once we have enhanced and increased our prana with pranayama, now what happens? Pratyahara. We withdraw our senses, dharana. We concentrate, dhyana. We enter meditative absorption and samadhi. We, we come into a, a state of bliss. We come, samadhi really means we are sim established simply just sitting there. It's something we go into and we come out of. Until you get to the level of Raghudas, our guru, and you, you come into a type of samadhi that is is permanent but you can you, you can uh, carry on your everyday life you can talk to the villagers about the price of rice or cooking oil or you can help someone re resolve the land division you can laugh and joke but you're always you this is called the sahaja samadhi it's it's beyond jnana it's a, a state where you're ever in samadhi, but you're able to carry on your daily life. What? Sahaja, easy or effortless. Entering the state of effortless samadhi. So the goal of yoga, stated in the, the very beginning of the yoga sutras, is yoga chitta vritti nirodaha. Yoga is to still the patterning of consciousness, to calm down the chitta vrittis. So from this, I've come to understand that yoga is of the very essence of via negativa. So there, there are two kinds of spiritual path, via negativa, the negative way, not meaning negative in any bad sense, and be a positiver, the positive way. So be a negativa is this whole process of sense withdrawal, focused concentration, meditative absorption, drawing in our senses as the tortoise draws its limbs into the shell and they're focusing. So to practice this, as, as the uh, her, yogi hermit told Sarananda in North India, I didn't get to meet that person, you need good air, good water, and good ground. Which, by the way, is basically unattainable uh, anymore on our planet. E even when Sarananda and I were living 
at 10 and a half thousand feet in the mountains, we were engulfed in smoke by the massive fire from well, at Yellowstone, hundreds of miles away. It's uh, You can get out of the brown cloud if you go high enough up, but it's hard to really get good air. We've looked in some of our classes of how the these legacy toxins a get into the rain and are deposited everywhere in the places that we think are pure. So getting good air, good water, and good ground is really difficult. And to practice this path, we should be living some kind of life of solitude in a special place where we can really devote ourselves. So Raghudas, my guru, used to say, uh, he would say to me, you know, that yoga path is very, very difficult and you Westerners won't be able to achieve it. Yes, yes, for sure. Do, 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 do your asanas so you can sit and they're good for your health and that's very nice. But you're not going to attain through that path. Your path is bhakti. Yours is the path of devotion. Then I brought my friend Kathy who was studying at the Iyengar Institute. And he said, oh, she is making progress on the path of yoga. But you, you do bhakti. You, you, you follow bhakti. So it is, it is a more difficult path to follow that via negativa. And there's also a way in which ultimately the two come together and are not different from each other. Ayurveda, along with bhakti and tantra, is via positiva. Via positiva means we embrace all the things of this world. We work with the senses. We do not withdraw our senses. We engage our senses. So we can see that Ayurveda says that health is the basis of everything and encourages us to enjoy a good sex life, good food, tasty food, pacify our senses with uh, proper enjoyment, right? In, in Ayurveda, not only are we not supposed to overstimulate late our senses with like way salty food and loud music and fast cars and alcohol. We're not supposed to overdo it, but we're also not supposed to underuse them either. Remember, that's one of the causes of disease is underusing our senses. We're supposed to have an appropriate engagement for all our senses in order to enjoy well-being and disease-free condition. Provide them with good, nice, enjoyable, appropriate objects. So that that to me is a massive difference between yoga and Ayurveda because Ayurveda, as I've been taught about it from the beginning, lines up with bhakti and tantra as a path of using our senses using all the objects of the senses and employing them in order to progress spiritually. If you remember the story that I always love to tell about the Buddha when he's done all these yogic austerities and he's so skinny and he's so weak and yet he's just as stupid as ever. And then he, he goes, he thinks, I've got, to, I've got to get somewhere. I've got to do something. So he goes and he finds a nice tree, a people tree. And he goes and sits under it. And he says, I shall meditate and attain enlightenment. And he goes to meditate. And he's so weak. And because his body is so weak, his mind is so weak. He can't settle himself. And right then appears to Jatta, appears a woman. A cow, a cowherd woman with a bowl of delicious kheer 
and the Buddha eats the delicious kheer, and that strengthens him, and then he sits in the firm pose, the full lotus, and then he meditates, and he withstands the attacks of Mara, and he remembers all of his past lives, and as the sun rises over the Ganges plains, the Buddha awakens. But he couldn't have done it without that moment of well-being. I forgot the most important part of the story, which is that when he sits down and he he can't meditate, he has a flash memory. He has a flash memory of another time that he was sitting under a tree. He was sitting under a rose apple tree in the beautiful palace garden when he was a little boy. And he remembers the feeling he had then. That just feeling of contentment and well-being. And he thinks, that's what I need to start my meditation. Then Sujata arrives with the bowl of kia. And he experiences a well-being from eating that delicious food prepared with love. That was the foundation for him attaining enlightenment. So in the end, the two do very much come together because we cannot accomplish via negativa without these positive attributes, good air, good water, good ground, proper food, a proper diet as laid out in Hatha Yoga Pradipika and Gerhanda Samhita are very pure, very nourishing very sustaining diet. We can't accomplish via negativa without some kind of a platform of positive well-being, which brings in Ayurveda. We also can't just dive into via positiva with no preparation. So in order to work with the positive, with the positive way, with engaging with our senses, we first have to purify our senses by being able to withdraw them. We, we first have to be able to abstain from in order to get into. So it, in order to work properly with our five senses as, as laid out in Ayurveda, First, we've got to let go of all the things that we're attached to that are either overuse of our senses or wrong use of our senses. So that's, that's with the turtle withdrawing its limbs so that we can then positively engage with the senses. So th these two paths are, are distinct. They are very much distinct. And it's good to be clear at any given time how we're engaging with them. And yet, they're interdependent. There's no yoga without Ayurveda. There's no Ayurveda without yoga. <laughs> In that sense, you could say they're, you could see them as sister sciences because in order to attain that goal of samadhi, we do need well-being. And in order to have this Ayurvedic life where we engage in a right, a positive, a happy way, eyes wide open with the world of the senses, we do have to be able to let go of our attachments to the objects of senses. So, so they, they fit together in an amazing way at the same time they are really distinct. Are, are there any questions or thoughts? I appreciate the framework of this uh, topic for hearing that for a second. A lot of things. So I just, that was a helpful, had I heard it so directly like that, but it really makes a lot of sense and how they inner how you need one for the other, that they interrelate to each other as well. 
appreciating the having this framework of knowing about the positive and negative part and how at the same time you can't embark on the be a negativa without some kind of basis in be a positiva and vice versa and there there's an important interplay between them and they are both part of our spiritual journey the ability to let go and the ability to engage there's two ways that we can make a shivalingam we can make a shivalingam that's simply unhewn stone that is that which cannot be known uh neti neti <laughs> that which we can only know by negating everything everything we know and going beyond the known uh that's known as nivriti the 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 turtle drawing in its limbs that is the nivriti the going beyond all the vrittis then you can there's also a shivalingam that has faces facing in all the directions and that's the pravriti that's the coming out to engage with the objects of sense in the world. Any other questions or comments? Just to clarify, so via negativa would be let, like I'm just not sure about the word drawing in. Is that in, like letting go? So if you think of a turtle or a tortoise, mm -hmm. um, have you ever had a pet tortoise? <laughs> we have my sister Kate always had pet tortoises. So if you tap on the shell and they get a little bit scared, then they'll pull their limbs inside the shell and they'll even pull their little heads inside the shell. That's the drawing in. That's what we mean by drawing in. And how like is that of your senses going out to the outer world? Your senses are going in and entering the shell. Mm -hmm. So instead of like hearing other people's advice, you draw them in and you hear mm -hmm. your own advice instead of seeing what's happening outside you see what's happening inside and that was the class that was doing more yoga in the, in the path of yoga we draw we uh the process of pratyahara that's the meaning of pratyahara we draw all our senses within like caitlin was saying which the um speaker microphone might not have picked up what you were saying we 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 draw our senses in so we're no longer looking with our outer eyes, we're looking within. We're, we're no longer tasting. We're tasting the bliss molecules within. We draw all our senses within. Is that gelling? Yeah, that makes sense. But then there'd be any now clarification and engaging our senses. So outwards. engaging our senses outwards in the path of Ayurveda bhakti, the, the yoga of devotion, and tantra m means we, we're we doing the opposite of what we've always been taught the spiritual path is. And we've been taught the spiritual path is asceticism and turning away from the objects of sense. In this way, we, we engage with, we relate to all of the objects of sense. And just need to learn how to use it in a balanced way, not to feel like right because the we have to learn to use it in a balanced way because Ayurveda teaches us that uh, we don't want to underuse our senses, we don't want to overuse them, we don't also don't want to give them wrong kinds of stimulus, like you know, illicit drugs and things that are you know. A te temporary you might feel good but you feel terrible afterwards because our senses don't need that we want to use our senses in a proper way just right like to listen to beautiful music or taste delicious food uh, or um wear comfortable clothing and so on is this right sounds very relative because this right is what's just right for our senses is different for every person and that's another conversation because that goes into the whole extroversion introversion thing that uh, what would be an underuse of senses for one person is perfect for another so it's, it's individual 
which are engaging with the senses, uh, making effort to provide them with proper objects. Of course, you can't always. We have to overcome aversion, so we there might be like stinks we don't like or loud sounds or whatever, and we have to learn to put up with it. But and from an Ayurvedic standpoint, we shouldn't like make a habit of it. We we should try to provide proper circumstances. And sorry, according to yoga, we're with, we're often a hermitage, withdrawn from all that. There, there's a quote from the um, Desert Fathers. The the Desert Fathers say things very similar to what I said in Perkia Vod. There's like short pithy things, and one of the Desert Fathers they would went off to live in the desert. Like in the Sinai, like in the desert, and and meditate and pray. One of them said, "If you can hear a bird sing, it is not silent." <laughs> she understands because she just was on a long retreat, and those birds can be so distracting. <laughs> Which is interesting, though, because I feel like from what I've learned, you learn to watch the sounds. And not to be yeah, you you can definitely meditate and learn to watch the sound, but in in this in via negativa, it was really set up for going and living in a cave in the Himalayas, or you can do it in a hut in the desert, or any of those like suitable places where you can be completely alone and free from all these uh, sense distractions. There was a saint, St. Simon Stylites. There were, there, there were saints that went and lived on pillars. And people would come and bring them food and they'd pull the food up. Uh, kind of like Julia Butterfly did in, in her redwood platform. But they just lived on this pillar. I, I know about that because I was in a play in which I was one of the characters that came and disturbed uh, <laughs> it disturbed him in his practices on the pillar. <laughs> okay. So that's a little look at my take on yoga and Ayurveda, ways they come together and ways that they differ. Thanks for listening. Bye. Thank you for tuning in to Ayurveda and Spirituality with Alakananda Ma. We hope today's exploration has ignited a spark of curiosity and insight within you. If you enjoyed this episode, be sure to leave us a five-star review and share it with a friend. For more enlightening discussions and practical wisdom on Ayurveda and spirituality, subscribe and join our Facebook group, Alundi Ayurveda. To allow us to continue sharing valuable content, consider donating to Alundi Ashram. The links will be in the show notes. Until next time, may you walk the path of Ayurveda with grace and embrace the light of spiritual wisdom in your journey. Triya.